first. Wonderful. I'm going to um, set us off with some introductions. Um, so this this presentation tonight has been organized by the Education Committee of the SELPA CAC. In November, we had an initial educational panel, um, which was um, about you know sort of I, I patients or I'm sorry patients sorry thinking about work um, parents and and um, staff were sharing um, tips on the IEP process, sharing their personal stories. And so we had a, a lively discussion and again, lots of people sharing their own experience about the IEP process and, and advice about going through it for the first time. So our goal tonight is go to the next step. So if you your child has had an IEP and you don't agree with what the IEP, the conclusions come from the IEP, what are the options available to you as a next step? So we have um, three parents who are going to share their their personal experiences. And we have an education advocate who's going to um, start us off with some, some background and then also um, share some, some tips at the end. So um, well, each person will introduce themselves as they, it is their turn to speak. But I'm going to turn the um, floor over to Cheryl Thies from, from DREDF, who's going to give a little bit of explanation about the value of local collaboration and the parent rights notice of procedural safeguards. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you guys put your thumbs up if you're hearing me? Thank you. Okay, so I'm so excited to see how many people are attending. Um, we have 52 participants. That's just fantastic. Thank you all. Uh, we're in that last quarter of the school year and I know we're all tired. Um, I wanna start by talking about the value of local collaboration because in order to get to the point where the families who are sharing with you tonight got, they sort of exhausted that option, but it's, it's always really important to, to note that that's where you want to start. So what I mean by that when I say local is generally your school district um, and your SELPA, which is in this case, the North Region SELPA. Um, for those of you who don't know, the SELPA stands for, because special ed is nothing if not filled with acronyms, Special Education Local Plan Area. And it basically lays out, it's a, it's a group of districts or sometimes one very large district, who, uh, and it lays out how resources will be shared and how money will come flow in and handles the community advisory committee, which is what we're involved in here tonight. Um, and there are a lot of problem solving processes there. So generally, you know, we start with our IEP team and we start with our school site and we try to resolve problems there. Part of what you're gonna hear tonight is about the fact that sometimes that doesn't work. It often works, but it doesn't always work. And when it doesn't work, um, and it's an issue that's very important. It's, it's important for you to know what to do. Um, and that's why knowing your own chain of command in your own school district, who your special education program specialists are, different districts call things different names, but basically you have a special education teacher and case manager. And then over that person is usually someone who's a program specialist or program manager. And then there's generally a director of special education um, and uh, you know, you want to go through those steps to solve problems, but it doesn't always work. So this is where our third bullet point, parent rights, comes in. I remember back in the day when I first started participating in the special education process for my son, who's now 26, that the notice of parent rights was just a pamphlet they handed me across the table, and I don't think I even looked at it at first. So we want you to know that that little brochure is full of really important rights, including all three of the options we're gonna talk about tonight and, um, and lots of other information about how to solve problems, what your rights are. And so it's very, very important. When you go to a meeting and they say, would you like another copy of your procedural safeguards, also known as your notice of parent rights, it's a good idea to say, well, has it changed since the last time I came to the meeting? And if you haven't ever looked at it, Take a copy, take it home, um, and try to understand it and reach out to the district, the SELPA, or to your parent center, and I'll talk more about that later um, if that's appropriate. So you have rights, the value, and people fought very hard when the special education law, IDEA, was put in place to make sure that families could be meaningfully engaged in this process and that there were ways to solve problems so that people didn't just get stuck. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. 
And that said, I think we'll, we'll launch right into our first example because we really want you to hear directly from the people who live this. All right. Thank you so much, Cheryl. So as you mentioned, we have three parents who are going to share their stories with us. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce Sarah, who's going to talk about a CDE complaint, what that is and her story. Anna's going to share her story regarding alternative dispute resolution. And then Melissa is going to talk about an independent educational evaluation. Um, Cheryl will then wrap up with some um, some advice about finding help. And then with the end, we will open it up to questions from the audience for the panel through the Q&A. And people can also raise, um, you know, raise their hands and, and we can unmute you so you can speak as well. Um, so both of those ways will be available to speak. And again, thank you so much for coming. We're excited to have so many of you here tonight as we as we launch into our program. And um, again, really, really appreciate the interest. So I will advance my slides and Sarah, Take it away, please. Let's see. There we go. All right. Hey, everybody. Good evening. Um, thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, filing a compliance complaint with the California Department of Education. Oh, I'm Sarah Taylor, and I have a 15 year old with intellectual disability um, and fragile X syndrome. If folks know what that is, it's kind of a relatively rare um, condition. Um, and um, so I'm going to talk about filing a compliance complaint, and that's something you can do if you feel that the district has violated special education laws or procedures, and um, and really anyone can file a compliance complaint. And there's um, for all of the procedures we're talking about, there's more details at the end of the slideshow, and we're keeping the slides uh, that the panelists are talking about right now just focused on our personal examples. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the incident that um, led to the action of my filing a compliance complaint. I should say this was back in 2018, and uh, the in individuals that were involved, um, I, I, they're, I, they're no longer working for the district that we were in. Um, something else I didn't mention about myself is uh, I'm the chair of the social work department at Cal State East Bay. Um, and a professor there. Um, so that's kind of my other hat and it's part of the lens that I bring to a lot of my work. Um, if you could click please. So um, we had a long history of major educational challenges in our district. Um, our son during his elementary school years um, had to change elementary, uh, change schools every single year of his elementary education. So you could probably understand how we really wanted to get it right for middle school. Um, so uh, this was about the transition to middle school, and um, we had started asking about it in October of his fifth grade year. And despite many discussions and requests and emails and donuts and cute pictures of our kids, just everything you can possibly imagine, um, as of July 31st, we had no actual IEP, um, and school was about to begin on August 20th. So um, we had a lot of unresolved issues, including discussions about whether my kid would have a one on one, which we felt he needed, but it, there was no decision about it, um, about how much mainstreaming time he would have and what that would look like. Um, access to science class, my son um, had been in a um, moderate severe kind of track and it was anticipated that starting in middle school that, that he would not go to science class, but he loves science. So I wanted him to have access to science class. Um, and uh, he also, he has a strength in terms of ELA. So I didn't want him in um, a, a mod severe ELA class. I wanted him to be in an ELA class that would be a little more challenging for him um, and transportation. So basically everything <laughs> was, was undecided. And, and Sarah, um, English language arts is what ELA means, right? Oh yeah, thank you for translating my, my acronym. Um, so there was a lot that was up on the air and we had sent, of course, many emails um, and tried to you know, figure out when can we meet and, and finalize the IEP. And there was just no actual IEP document. There'd been meetings, there'd been some drafts shared, there'd been some discussions, but we did not have in our hands a final IEP. And so um, I put in here what we wrote in our compliance complaint. We described the situation and then we kind of summed it up by saying the lack of responsiveness, lack of proper documentation and extended timeline have limited our ability to, ex to explore all appropriate educational options for our son, exercise our parental rights, 
participate meaningfully in the IEP process and prepare our son for this transition. The timeline has also inhibited the district's ability to train teachers and staff and put other supports in place to ensure that our son has a successful transition and a more stable educational placement than he experienced in elementary school. So basically our argument was that if we don't even have an IEP, we can't, there's nothing for us to argue against and advocate in some of the other ways, because that's a really important procedure to have the IEP in the first place so that you have something that you're at least saying, this is, this is not what we want, or this is not what our son needs. Um, next slide, please. So um, just one click, thanks. Um, so basically, we felt that procedures had been violated and that they reflected on larger issues within the district. Um, next click, please. So um, we, this is a timeline, and I'm not going to read through the whole timeline for the sake of time, and I believe everybody has a link to the slides, but what I want to show you is that this was extremely fast. Um, it was one of the fastest advocacy things we ever did. Um, so we sent our complaint in on July 31st. We got a phone call from the CDE investigator just a few days later. Um, they asked for some additional documents. We sent them, you know, um, basically um, we had our IEP by August 16th. So just a little over two weeks later, we had that IEP that we had wanted. Um, and we were offered actually everything we asked for, which was totally amazing, but it didn't last after the 30 day IEP, but that's a story for another day. Um, and we ended up, the district requested that we withdraw the complaint and we did. So um, that was our kind of overview of our experience. Next slide, please. So some takeaways and tips from this experience. Um, the complaint we actually sent was a form, like the CDE has a form to fill out and we wrote our own two page letter. So in the body of the form where it says, please describe what's going on. I said, please see the attached letter. Um, this can be done without a lawyer or professional advocate, although you can if you wish, but we, I just did it on my own. Um, the process is fully electronic. It's really important that what you're describing is procedural violation. So I would not have chosen a CDE complaint if I had that IEP, because then I would have used one of the other means of advocacy that folks are going to talk about tonight, but it was it was a procedural violation to not have an IEP at all. Um, try to be as objective and fact based as possible. I mean, of course, I had all the feelings, so many feelings, but that wasn't for that two page letter. So I had friends review my draft complaint and give me some constructive feedback. It's really important to read all of the policies and procedures and do exactly what they say and respond really promptly to any communication. So you know, though I'd like to send everybody to voicemail, when that CDE person called me, I was like, yeah, I'm here, you know, because I really wanted to get this resolved. You have to provide suggestions for resolving the complaint. So in my case, it was pretty easy. I said, I want an IEP. <laughs> um, and um, districts are really motivated to resolve these complaints um, and get them withdrawn because uh, when, the, when the complaints accumulate, the district can um, experience some some kinds of um, penalties and, and things. So um, anyway, that's my story. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Anna. Thank you so much, Sarah. And just to clarify there, when you said you wanted an IEP, was that that you wanted a meeting about the IEP or you wanted the document or kind of both? I mean, kind of both. Yeah. So but there, there hadn't been a, a meeting. Is that OK? There had been some meetings, but it hadn't resulted in any resolution and any document. Thank you for clarifying. All right, and thank you for sharing. All right, Anna, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sabrina. All right, I'm Anna Johnson. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome, I'm going, to, I'm going to set my timer for nine minutes so I can definitely wrap up within 10. Um, so my name's Anna Johnson and I have a 15 year old and an 11 year old. My 15 year old is, um, uh, is my student with disabilities. And we, we pursued alternative dispute resolution um, when she was in middle school. So the alternative dispute resolution is kind of an informal method of settling disagreements. Um, you generally met, you definitely meet with someone from the SELPA to facilitate a meeting and uh, folks from the district office. So, uh, it's not a place or an event in which you meet with your IEP team. It's kind of held outside of that um, formal process. Um, 
And so the incident that led to the action was we actually had an IEP that we fully consented to. Um, and so uh, we had issues at the school site for implementing the IEP as it was written and consented to. Um, there were staffing challenges for speech and um, uh, SAI minutes or specialized academic instruction. Um, and uh, that kind of snowballed into issues with making progress towards IEP goals, implementing accommodations. And, and then by the end of the year, it became um, a big issue in negotiating um, her annual IEP for the upcoming year. So um, we chose this method because since there were so many issues and it was getting complex and it also looked like it was gonna be an ongoing issue based on um, some of the, the way the school operated, <laughs> it was bigger than just, you know, our kid. Um, uh, it couldn't be resolved in just one um, compliance complaint related to one procedural violation. Um, we, it was just, it was bigger than that. So um, we chose this method of resolution so that we could kind of get out of the school bubble and go directly to the district office where, um, where there are more possibilities for creative problem solving. Um, and so can you go ahead and click next slide so I can talk about what the experience is like? Um, so I wrote a letter requesting um, alternative dispute resolution. I sent it to the principal, our case manager, and the district um, special ed director at the time. And um, don't switch it to the next slide yet, but on my next slide, I will be talking about kind of the tips for writing that letter. And then I forwarded that letter to the SELPA director. And um, what happens after the SELPA director uh, receives that letter is that they'll go ahead and um, they worked with me and the district to find a mutual um, date that I, I think it was around, it was before 30 days. We didn't have to wait that long. Um, it was faster than holding another IEP meeting. And then um, uh, the step three, what I did before I actually met with the district and the, um, the SELPA facilitator is that my husband and I brainstormed all these different possible resolutions um, so that we kind of had that as our anchor when we went and had discussions um, during the alternative, just uh, um, the ADR meeting. So then step four is you, we met at the district office. Um, we were asked to sign a non-disclosure. The district also signed a non-disclosure that allowed us to kind of speak freely. Um, and um, have unconventional conversations than you would normally have in an IEP meeting. Um, so I kind of felt um, that was one of the benefits of the experience. Um, the SELPA staff facilitates um, a lot of the time was spent going over some of our concerns and issues, um, but I also requested and I recommend this for other families is that you request that the last 10 minutes, at least the last 10 minutes, um, be used to review resolution and kind of discuss any obstacles related to your proposed resolution. So you can kind of work through, um, work through that. And then next step five is, you know, maybe you leave that meeting with an agreement that you can sign. Um, uh, generally, it's time bound, so you may have 48 hours if you've come to an agreement to sign it. Um, maybe it's a new IEP offer. It just really depends on the um, situation. And sometimes there's just silence. You don't have agreement. And um, kind of whatever stays inside the ADR meeting, because you've signed that non-disclosure, kind of stays there. Um, <laughs> so, um, so it's not like... Um, unless maybe you have some in agreement that you're just trying to tie up some loose ends and there's just a, a few things that you need to work through. Um, but 
Um, but it, you could also have silence. So it could go either way. Go ahead and next slide, please. So these are my tips for what to put in your letter request. Um, I like to do three components to all my letters generally when I work with, um, when I advocate for my daughter. So this is just my formula for everything, but I definitely used it for, AD, for to request the ADR. Um, so I include what I notice and give facts about my daughter. Um, I also give facts about the issues that we had and it changes and it varies depending on your situation, but some of that is related to services missed, a quantifiable regression based on test scores. Um, some of the, the conflict was related to, you know, the school team said, yeah, she made her goal. And then you ask, well, how do you know? <laughs> and they, they either won't share the student work or data with you or they've shared it and and you you guys don't agree on what you're seeing in terms of meeting that IEP goal that's a common um, kind of conflict. Um, I also list uh, concerns so I always begin the bullet points with I'm concerned about my student failing their failure to meet their IEP goals. I'm concerned that there's a change in intervention. I'm concerned that I get phone calls home and I've offered suggestions on how to resolve conflict at school, but it, I still get phone calls. I'm concerned about my students' mental health, or I'm concerned that all the concerns that I've listed before had continue to go unaddressed. And then, um, and then I include the proposed resolution and it can change, it can depend again on your, on your, your student situation, but it could be related to compensatory ed, a change in placement, you know, an expedited IE, a request for a new assessment. It just, it could be a bundle of lots of things, um, but it needs to relate to your areas of what you notice and your concerns. Go ahead and do next slide. Anna, would you mind just defining very briefly comp, comp ed? Cause we're throwing that term around and I'm just concerned some people might not know what it means. Oh, sure. So, um, that's a great question. So for compensatory ed, and I'll, I'll use a specific example. So, so let's say your student gets um, speech and language services two times a week, but there is no speech therapist and they've gone without speech and language services for, um, for three months <laughs> because there's no staffing. Um, and so uh, the formula that I use is that what, what would it take to not just replace those services, the service minutes that were missed? Um, what would it take had those service minutes been met, but, and they had made progress um, in order to meet where they would normally be at that moment? I wish I had a graphic to show. So, so it's not a minute for minute, um, compensation. It could be times two. Maybe you need double the minutes now in order to make up for those lost services. And I, um, I, uh, um, I try to get two quotes. I call private speech therapists and ask what their rates are. And um, the state also has a list of non-public um, agencies. And so you can go and look for speech therapists through that list and call them up and ask what their their hourly rates are. And then um, I kind of put that into a budget template and, um, and that kind of gives me an idea of what, um, of what to ask for in terms of comp ed. Does that, is that a good answer? We have a raised hand in general. We are using, we're gonna use the raised hands for discussion at the end, but if someone has a point that they need to clarify right now, um, I actually think this question should probably wait if that's okay, because okay. it's a really good question, but it's, you know, I think it would be better to have a more open dis discussion about it. But to Anna's question about whether that explains it, we, we just want you all to know that we have a lot of resources at the end of the presentation that talk about this more and some places you can call for help. Yeah. Um, but it, it, cause it is complex and sometimes it's services and sometimes it's compensation and anyway, um, but the it could ask, we want to put a student back in the position they would have been in had the lapse in services not occurred. Thank you so much for being concise. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. All right, so I'll, I'll quickly go over, I think I'm at my 10 minute mark, but I'll quickly go over the slide. Um, some of the advantages of um, 
uh, going through ADR is you're able to speak candidly for district admin. Um, and the reason why that's important is because sometimes the district office um, has uh, decision-making ideas that are different than what can happen at a school site. Um, and sometimes uh, it's what the district might say that, they, that your student needs or to implement the IEP doesn't always execute at the school site. So um, I, th I think it's important that you kind of know the power dynamics about how, how um, decisions are made. Um, and so uh, I feel like it's, you're closer to the decision, decision maker and you're able to kind of talk about some creative problem solving. So maybe it's tutoring after school, but the, you know, the IEP team doesn't feel like it's within their role and responsibility to add that to the IEP, but maybe, maybe there's a district resource that you can access that's um, different than what the school team feels comfortable talking about. Um, you can refine the resolution in a way that um, um, that meets your schedule, your needs, um, just considerations that, again, feel like they are inappropriate to talk about in an IEP meeting. Um, you can walk away with a signed agreement and no attorneys are involved. Um, the limitations, though, is if you do have a settlement agreement and you're asked to sign it within a 48 hour time frame, um, I recommend that you should consult an attorney so that they can review it um, before signing. There are some things that it's a legal document. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm not an attorney. They just have their own lens that they can, you know, catch a couple things or considerations that you wouldn't necessarily have thought about. Um, and then a lot of families feel frustrated by the actual process um, because there's unresolved feelings of worry, anger, and frustration. It's not really a place for restorative justice. Um, that's that's not the function or purpose of ADR. Um, but I felt it was useful, but it's a useful exercise to go through um, because you're really having to hone the idea of what does my student need in order to resolve this issue. Um, and sometimes that's really hard to put into words, but you're forced to put it onto paper. And that's my, thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you for sharing, Anna, we really appreciate it. So hold those questions till the end. And then um, I'm going to introduce Melissa Fleshman. Um, trying to advance the slides. All right, here we go. So Melissa was going to share with us about an independent, her experience with an independent educational evaluation. Thank you for joining. Hi, can everyone hear me and see me? Perfect. Okay, so I'm here to share my experience of what's short for IEE. It's an independent educational evaluation. I am not an expert on this. I'm speaking from my own personal experience. And it's basically an opportunity for um, parents to be able to get a second look or a second an opinion evaluation of their child. Um, and I apologize, I actually should introduce myself. Um, I'm Melissa Fleshman, and I am a mom of a 10 year old and a 12 year old. My 10 year old student is the one that um, that had the IEE done. So I just wanted to go back and introduce that. Um, so really, when a parent doesn't agree with an evaluation with the district and it's conducted and it can be in any area or all areas, um, that's the parent's opportunity to be able to say, hey, hold on, I don't think I agree with this and they can actually file for where they can request an IEE. Um, I had help from an educational advocate and this is how I learned to do this. Um, and the reason that it's helpful is because if you don't agree with it, even though it's, it's in the procedural safeguards um, that you have the right to not agree. And that's really important to keep in mind is that that's your right as a parent. 
you don't have to agree with what the district says. This is your opportunity to say, no, I think I want to get a second look. Um, and the IEP determines the eligibility and, you know, they design an individualized program based on that. But if there's incomplete data or if there are, if there's anything that's not feeling like it's accurate to your students, your child, um, this is how you do it. So the way to do that is you need to put it in writing. Um, and you have to say that you disagree with the district's findings. And their answer from that can be either to fund that or file it. If they fund it, that means that they will pay for the outside evaluators to assess your student. If they file, that means that it will go to due process. And that's when you will be against the district and you'll need to figure out how to collect more data or whatever you'll need to to do. That was not my experience. Um, and I'll get into that, but you should know too that the district, they will provide like a list of providers. You don't necessarily have to go with that list. You can look at the list, but like my experience, you know, my child was found ineligible um, during distance learning which was tough. <laughs> um, I chose the IEE because at the time they had said that they, they didn't find him eligible and they wanted to wait until he went back to school, which would delay it until the fall and possibly even longer than that. And I have already been waiting so long to get support in place for him that I didn't feel that that was the right decision. Um, when choosing an evaluator, I cannot express more the importance of really talking to more than one person. Get a feel for who that evaluator is and if there's a connection and if you feel that your child will connect with that evaluator too, it's, it's crucial. So I talked to more than one evaluator. I wanted to really experience, okay, yes, my son's going to be good with this evaluator. He'll be comfortable. He'll feel confident. He's not going to, he's not going to feel that he's not going to cooperate because he's uncomfortable. Um, and the experience for me of this doing the IEE was absolutely incredible because having these evaluators validate this is my son. I mean, reading their reports, I, I had tears come to my eyes because it's like, wow, they know my son. They know who he is. They know what he's all about and they know what he needs. And it was all in writing. And I felt empowered and I felt that, wow, finally, like my son is going to get everything he needs. And because I went this route, um, he was able to become eligible. I took that leap of faith. I did it. And he got eligibility and he's getting his needs met now. Um, if anyone has any questions about the process or you know how to go about this, I'm happy to answer any questions or concerns. Um, I Melissa, will say, could you, would you mind talking, Melissa, just for a quick minute? This is Cheryl. Um, oh, yeah. About um, the fact that you get an IEE for each evaluation you disagree with. So, which ones did you right. disagree with? Did you, because it can be right. more than so, one. Right. So, for me, it was um, OT, occupational therapy, and speech and language. And I should specify that actually, my experience was that no one from the team actually called and like they didn't do they could have easily done zoom with to meet my son they also could have done a phone conversation to meet my son and they did not so they didn't do their job um and it was unfortunate i was really hopeful that they could have reached out and i know that other districts at that time were meeting in person or doing it by zoom um so yeah for me it was it was um, occupational therapy and speech and language, and actually, sorry, psycho evaluation, psychoeducational uh, as well. So I did all, I actually asked for all three. 
And did you have to pay first to get reimbursed or did the district fund these people directly? I did not. I was very fortunate. The district funded it. I think that they, they knew that um, they, they weren't able to follow through on what was necessary to determine his eligibility and they agreed to fund it. Well, that sounds, that's a great story with a happy ending. So thank you for sharing. I'm sure a lot of work in the process, but it sounds like the right thing was done for your, for your son. So right. thank you. Thank well, you for I, letting me share. Yeah. Well, I think then I'm going to um, turn the floor over to Cheryl, who's going to share some of her experience and advice as an education advocate. And uh, my screen is just a little slow to catch up here. There we go. Okay, everybody. So these are three great examples, and they're all really different um, of ways that when the IEP process breaks down, when you, whether it's because you just can't reach an agreement, or you think that the district just is not following the IEP or following the law, or because you think that you need to resolve it in a format where there's more flexibility for the team that, you know, the team is kind of stuck and you've taken it as far as you can. Um, these are all um, ways, and there are other ways, and we have some information about what you, where you can get that help, and I'll go over that in a minute. But some of the common signs that the local collaboration that I started talking about at the beginning has broken down. Often it's, it's actually something I think all of you have talked about, which is you know trust and communication starts to break down. You're, you're meeting over and over again on the same issue, you're not getting anywhere or an evaluation is presented and you're saying that does not describe my child. And I wanna make it clear from um, Melissa's story that you don't have to say, well, they should have used this test and not that test. You don't have to be that, you just say, I disagree with the assessment. It's not capturing my child's needs. And the reason we, we think it's so important is that you build an IEP on a foundation of information about where they are right now. So if those evaluations don't capture those needs, you're sort of building a house on a weak foundation and then it, you don't get the progress that you want. Um, sometimes you've tried some of these other processes. You Maybe you've gone to the special ed director or you've gone to the SELFA and it's not getting resolved. Um, sometimes you just have reached the impasse and I tell parents this all the time, you know, is this the hill you want to die on? And by that, I mean, you know, we don't need to argue about an, every little thing. And sometimes reasonable people disagree. But there are some issues, for example, eligibility in Melissa's case, right? Um, or a good transition plan to middle school or um, a compliance violation where it's like, I'm not, I can't mess around with this anymore. The, the school year is going by. My student needs to be at the center of how we're resolving things. Um, so for all of those reasons, you know, you, you may be trying to figure out whether uh, it's, it continues to be productive to try to solve it inside the umbrella of the district, the charter, I'm sorry, the SELPA, um, whatever. Um, so what kind of help is out there? And we wanted to go over this with you all because obviously if you have the resources, one thing you can do is go hire an attorney. And there's times when you know people do that, but we're gonna talk about some of the other options. So the first one is that in every state and territory in the United States, there's a parent training and information center. Um, I work at one, Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. We are the parent center that serves Alameda and 29 other counties here in Northern California. Um, there's also family empowerment centers and family resource centers. And all of these organizations are no cost. And we're not going to give you legal advice. So you're not calling us for us to tell you what you need to do is file a compliance complaint. What we're gonna to say to you is here are the possible options. You could call another meeting. You could file a complaint. You, have you thought about an IEE? Do you know what that is? Um, what about this alternative dispute resolution? Have you ever heard of that? So we're just trying to help you navigate the systems and the options. Um, we're not going to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. Um, sometimes we provide uh, referrals, so these organizations, and we have a list of them in, in our resources, so Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, DREDF, Disability Rights California, you may have heard of, the Community Alliance for Special Education, um, 
the family family resource navigators, you know, all of these agencies provide this kind of help in our area. And we do things like parents call us and say, I'm getting ready, or I just had an IEP and they didn't find my child eligible. What now? And we talk about you know, what the options are. And we have sample letters and things that you can, you can include. Um, sometimes we put on trainings kind of like this on different topics. So for example, we do you know IEP basics and beyond. We, we do a training on transition to adulthood and a training on mental health behavior um, and discipline. So, you know, you can come to those kinds of things. Um, the other important thing we do do is provide, oops, I put referrals twice there, see, um, is provide referrals. So sometimes it's, gosh, you know, we really, you're at the point where we've kind of exhausted how we could help you. So here are your next step options. And here are some local lawyers, here are some private advocates. Um, we can, you know, provide you that information. The Council of Attorney Parents Council of Attorney Parents, help me out, Sherry, uh, uh, and Advocates and Attorneys. There we go. Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates, COPA, has a list um, of advocates and attorneys. We maintain one at Dredis. Um, again, we're not recommending anybody, but we make sure people have a, are in good standing with their license and that kind of stuff and that they represent parents. So these are all ways that you can get help when you can't solve the problem sort of within the domain of the IEP process. Um, next slide. Oh, so something went off. Okay, so one thing, if you could go back for a minute. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, there we go. So we do maintain a list of attorneys who will do a sliding scale. Um, we can't force any attorney to help you. And I, just to be crystal clear, one thing attorneys do is they decide what, look at the facts of the case and tell you whether they think there's an issue that is, you know, uh, worth hiring an attorney for them, whether they think there's a, a reasonable chance of resolving it. Um, the, the, the big takeaways about what, when to get this outside help, first of all, you want to be, help people understand your situation. And I often tell parents, how could you describe what's happening for your child and what's going wrong with the process if you couldn't say the words? What document could you show them? What checklist? What video? What teacher report? Start of state testing? You know, what, what's your, your data or evidence about what, what's going on? Um, there are some downsides to um, going outside the district and, and particularly when things escalate um, to an attorney or a private advocate. Um, so sometimes parents are really worried. They'll all call us and say, well, I don't want to. And, and there's, there's a cultural element to this too because different groups of people feel differently about this. But um, I don't want to seem disrespectful to the district. Um, I don't want to question the teacher. I don't think the teacher has it right, but I feel I don't want the, to tell the school psychologist that I don't agree with her assessment. So we can help you talk through some of that. Um, and people also worry that relationships can be damaged because sometimes if you escalate a situation all the way into a hearing or due process, um, you're, in a lot of situations, your child's still going to be at that school and at that district for many, many years. And um, you know, parents worry about that. And I think it's a, it's a reasonable concern. Those are all things you can call and talk through with us and the other organizations that are in the slide. So I'm gonna stop there because we have some great questions and I wanna make sure we can be responsive to them. Great. And Cheryl, did you want to go through any of the documents at the end or should I just highlight for everybody that we do have resources that are available? Why don't you flick through and I'll just okay. point out a couple. Um, all right, again, a little bit of a delay here. Let okay. me try again. There we go. All right, so first of all, we included some resources about your parent rights. One of the most important cornerstones of the special education law, which is called IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, is that parents are part of the team and have a right to be meaningfully uh, engaged in the process. So knowing your rights is really important. Information really is power. What you don't know can hurt you sometimes. And there have been situations where in, in my job where I've seen that, you know, someone at the school site actually just didn't know. For example, someone was recently uh, told, you come back and we'll do an evaluation after the doctor diagnoses your child with a medical condition. That's not correct. But 
I think the school district person actually really believed that it was. And so, you know, you're in this, he said, she said, that kind of thing. So there's some information about that. We included the forms and how the process works to file that compliance complaint. And some also uh, another complaint we didn't talk about tonight. You can always call us to learn more about it, which is sometimes the issue is you think your child's being discriminated against. Um, we didn't have an example of that before. Example, everybody goes on a three-day three outdoor environmental education field trip, at least they did before COVID. Um, and uh, the child's, the family's told, well, unless you come with your child, they can't come because we can't have their para available. So that there are dis discrimination issues. Um, there's information about alternative dispute resolution, um, including our own SELPA's guide, which is in a whole bunch of different languages, which is awesome. And then uh, I think if you flip to the next one, more on what an IEE is, how to get one, um, and then some information about dispute resolution, especially this first one, this is CADRE, which is the um, Center for, let's see, Appropriate Dispute Resolution in Education or Special Education uh, is a great site, so visit it. Um, and there's also some other, other resources here. I'm going to stop there. Um, yeah. And I believe we will. So I know the presentation is being recorded, but I think, and someone else from the SELPA CAC can correct me if I'm wrong, that we will have these slides with these links available probably on the CAC website. So if that is not correct, someone please let me know. And we could certainly send them to you in a PDF, and then you would have the link. And sometimes, um, if there's anybody on the call, I, I think this is super important for us all to remember who isn't tech savvy and preferred that it just be mailed to you. Uh, you know, we, I dread if we were happy to print something out and just mail it to you if that works better for you. And here's some more in letters and other things as well. So, all right, perfect. Well, again, thank you so much to our four panelists. I am going to stop screen sharing just so it's a little bit easier for me to see what's going on. And, um, and then I will, um, let's see. Stop screen sharing. Hmm. All right. Minor technical difficulties <laughs> as I try to. There we go. OK, terrific. So I know we had um, a hand raise. We have about five questions so far in the Q&A. Let me go back to the, um, let me try and look at the participants and see the, um, I think we have a couple of hands raised there. So let me start there to begin with. So I think, um, Carmen, I see that you have your hand raised. I am going to um, allow you to talk. So please go ahead and um, address the group. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the information. My name is Carmen Sanchez. I am the parent of an eight-year-old child. And my question to the panelists is, what can I do when is the district who is um, asking me to have a um, ADR because um, there were some proposals that they did with the IP that I said that I didn't, you know, care for them, and um, now they are preparing to. Um, have an ADR with me. So that's my question. What in my my fear is can they take my child from where he is and put him or her where they want to? That's my question. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. That's a that's a good question. Um, and actually, we had another question early on that I typed an answer to because I'm so used to doing that. But, and we'll come back to those so that everybody can be aware of them. Um, but it was similar. So first of all, the alternative dispute resolution, and Anna, you might want to talk about this. It's a voluntary process, right? So you don't have to participate in the ADR. You can say, you know, no, I actually want to, you know, go forward with a due process hearing or I'd like, I think I'm going to file a compliance complaint because I think the issues are about the district not following the law or the local procedures and or implementing the IEP. You have some options. Anna, do you want to talk more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think of um, alternative dispute resolution as kind of low risk, but the potential is high, high reward, good resolution. Um, and then it, uh, in preparation, 
I think about what obstacles there are. So uh, you can focus on the disagreement and there's time and space to do that with the facilitator. But in my, in, in the little voice inside my head, it's like, what is the obstacle for the district that, um, that doesn't enable them to, um, to follow through on my suggestion? What is that obstacle? Because you may not find the real answer in an AP meeting, but behind closed doors after signing a non-disclosure, they may be candid about what the real obstacle might be about um, uh, following through on what your suggestion is. So I feel like it's low risk just going in and seeing what happens and it could be good reward. I don't know. Yeah, I think the one thing that in my experience that it does too is when it works, and it doesn't always work, but when it does, and when it doesn't work, you still have all the other rights that we've talked about and, and others that we haven't talked about, including the right to file for a hearing and there's timelines and, and so on. Um, so I agree with Anna that it's, you know, often low risk and it can preserve relationships. Sometimes it's, you know, it's awkward to have an IEP meeting, for example, about a teacher who doesn't, who may have the right credentials, but doesn't appear to be doing an adequate job um, or following the IEP. Um, and so sometimes within the confines of a more confidential conversation, that problem can get resolved. Um, but I think it's really important that you feel comfortable and prepared for going to that ADR session. And I'd encourage you, Carmen, to, to give us a call at DREDF um, or reach out to some of the other organizations that we've included so you can you know, really decide whether you wanna participate. It's also, and Anna, you said this, it can be much faster. So for example, a due process hearing can go on. You know, there are multiple steps. There's a resolution session in 10 days. There's a, a mediation that's voluntary, but may or, and may or may not happen. There's you know, multiple steps people can ask for delays. Um, so sometimes when it's a really urgent situation, like Anna described, like it's about placement next year, or I think, um, you know, uh, some of the other examples too, you know, where time really is of the essence, then I think it can be, it can be very, very helpful. Um, and Cheryl, I think you're addressing this, but Carmen, you shared that one of your fears was that you could be forced to do something or they could place without your permission. And an ADR cannot be used to force a unilateral decision. So that's right. Even and if I you think I, I said this in one of the answers. Thank you, Sabrina, for helping me. Um, uh, but I think it's really important to know that one of your parent rights is an important protection known as stay put. Um, and what that means is that when there is a disagreement, and this isn't necessarily for compliance or other kinds of problems, when there is a disagreement and you're trying to use your parent rights to resolve it, including filing for a hearing, but also asking for ADR, or asking for an independent educational evaluation because you think you need a second opinion, that during that process, the district can't change your child's placement except under very, very specific circumstances that we don't need to go into here. Um, it's so that at that point, the last signed IEP that you did agree to stays in effect. So somebody had asked in an earlier question, well, what if they're trying to exit my child from special education and I'm not in agreement? That's a situation where parents often ask for an independent educational evaluation because they're saying, if, if you've done a new evaluation and you think my child doesn't need these services anymore, and the thing parents tell us all the time is um, they're doing better because they're getting services take away their services and they're not going to be doing better. So that, you know, you get into this, um, that in those kinds of situations, it's often a good idea to know that, you know, just to understand your rights to, to stay put and to know that, you know, your child, while the issue is getting resolved, they can't withdraw your child from special education, change their placement, put them in another program or anything like that. And that's why knowing your parent rights is so important because if you don't know to, in, to start this process, um, I think parents often feel like they don't have those options. All right, let me go through some of the other questions. Um, so um, we had a question really directed to Anna. I'm wondering why the conversations with an ADR have to be different, less free than those during an IEP meeting. And um, 
she shared that her motivation is to improve pathways for family to communicate all their concerns. Yeah, I think this is a great question. And I'll give you an example about, you know, in the role of a case manager. Um, at one of our IEP meetings, um, my student really wanted a middle school elective. And the case manager said, yes, an elective next year is would be great. And the special ed director attended the IEP meeting and the special ed director said, yes, totally, let's sign her up for an elective. But the principal said no. <laughs> and the principal who runs the master schedule for the school, it's the principal. Is the case manager going to, there's some weird norms that are going on. The case manager might be reporting to the principal and not want to push so hard. So, um, and the, the principal wanted to put my student in a, in a specialized academic setting where, um, where it didn't address any of her needs. It was, it was unrelated to her disability. So it was, um, she wouldn't be working on IEP goals. She wouldn't be getting any appropriate interventions. It was just a weird placement. Anyway, um, so, so why are these conversations different? Well, the principal doesn't attend the ADR and I can go directly to the district and they can work some, you know, situation at the district level <laughs> that doesn't involve me, doesn't involve me asking uncomfortable questions to the principal and it doesn't put the case manager in an uncomfortable situation with their manager. So um, that's just one example of kind of strange power dynamics that might happen between schools and um, district offices and parents. Great. I think it's also important just to add that right now, uh, because of COVID, um, there are some there are some funds that have come to the districts around compensatory education and helping make up for lost services and things that weren't provided during COVID. Specifically, I'm talking only about special education students here, not about the, the learning loss programs for other students. Um, and so sometimes ADR, I found that some IEP teams are just, they just don't know how to manage that. Um, but ADR can be a good place to have the conversation about, you know, what about a summer pro tutoring program? What about doing ESY this year, even though I'm not asking you to make it forever? So that kind of creative problem solving um, is very helpful. And I found that districts or districts might have contracts already in existence with NPAs that the actual school sites don't no, know anything agencies. about. Yeah, so, so, so private contractors, yeah. Yeah. And then Cheryl, there were a few questions that were in the Q&A that you were able to answer. I don't know, some of those came in early. Do you wanna quickly give yeah. a summary and of those? Were, I, I answered them because they were so easy and then they just disappeared, so I forgot. Oh, um, one okay. is just how long, is there a statute of limitations? Or, uh, basically, is there a, a timeline for compliance complaints? So all of these processes that are sort of defined in the law are, they have timelines. And for a compliance complaint, you have one year, so 12 months from the time that you became aware of the violation. So some of his parents say, well, I didn't know she wasn't getting speech. No one told me the occupational therapist, you know, left the school or went out on maternity leave or whatever. I'm just now finding out. So that's when the clock starts to tick, but you only have 12 months. For discrimination issues, you only have six months. Um, and due process has a whole bunch of different timelines um, that we can provide you more information than there's resources about, but, they, but they're you know, very firm timelines. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to understand these processes because you might choose the one, like with an independent educational evaluation, the, the bar is, the, the standard is without unreasonable delay. So that's kind of vague. Um, and it can be, you know, a month or two before you get an answer um, and you don't really have any, any kind of compliance hammer to say, well, you were supposed to answer me within X, Y, Z number of days. So uh, it's important that, and you guys are asking all the right questions about, about the timeline. Um, the other question, let me just go back to it because there was one more quick one was, um, hold on, answers, here we go. Um, Oh, someone asked about the chain of command. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, I probably shouldn't use that term because I don't want to make you think that you're dealing with the military because really we don't want our schools. We want to have good collaborative relationships with our school. And I don't want to set a tone of like, you know, it's about a chain of command. On the other hand, we all know that. I mean, I was on the phone today with the water company about a leak 
and I still that was out of sight. Um, and I had to go up the chain of command to know who was the right person who could help me. So if you want that information and it's, you can't find it on your school district site, like who is in, who's the administrator, who's the, who's the district team for special education, um, you can certainly reach out to the SELPA um, and you, or you can reach out to um, your parent training information center us at Dredek and we can help like put you in charge. Sometimes we just know the people um, and we'll just say, oh, they're at XYZ school. We know that program specialist. Here's the email and just give it to you. So reach out to us. And then I know there was an early question asking if we would include scenarios in which your child is considered no longer eligible for an IEP. It's a little bit different than um, than Melissa's story where it was an initial eligibility, but I guess the same idea. So an IEE could be used. Um, is that true, Cheryl, or would there be another approach if your, is. your child is? Yeah, thanks. And I think, and I weigh in here too, because I know you have some experience with this and, and I hope our parents pipe in if you wanna add stuff because we wanna hear from you. Um, I, my experience is that one thing that often happens is that people will say, well, your child's no longer, this is at the site, school site level, your child's no longer eligible because they met their goal. And you don't exit a student from special education because they met their goal. You exit them from special education because you have evaluated them and they are no longer eligible. Um, and then you can challenge that uh, evaluation or you can say, we think you used the wrong standard or whatever. So sometimes a compliant complaint is very handy because you say, and I think you talked about this when you talked about the compliance complaint. Um, uh, it can be, you know, I'm going to file a compliance complaint. In fact, here it is all filled out to the district because the basic issue here is that you're trying to exit my child from special ed, but you haven't reevaluated them. And this came up a lot during COVID too. Um, and often once you get to a special education administrator, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, yeah, let's, let's resolve that. You don't need to file that complaint. Let's resolve that um, because it's a very resolvable resolvable issue. And then there's another good question about how do you know if the IEP is setting the bar high enough? Um, and this um, person shared that, you know, they appreciate what the school is doing and the help their child is getting, but they are falling behind academically. They don't want to push them beyond their capabilities, but also don't want the gap to increase. So how do you figure that out? And I think Sarah had shared a little bit. I don't know, Sarah, if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, sure. I'll say a bit more about that. So, you know, um, I think for all children of different challenges, you know, for my son, because he has intellectual disability, people um, often just really underestimate what he can do. Um, the, they set the bar exceedingly low for him. Um, but there have been times when he just has demonstrated his awesomeness. I mean, as all kids do. So um, for us, for example, with the science thing, um, we had advocated in fifth grade for him to be able to go to science camp, which um, kids in the mod severe special day class typically didn't get to go to. So we successfully advocated for him to go to science camp. And I'll just say, I think all kids should go to science camp. Um, science camp was the best. Um, so he went and he, he far exceeded everyone's expectations. Like people just could not, they were blown away by his attention, his interest, his ability to do all the things. He was amazing. Um, and so he showed that he really is interested in science, that when he is engaged in a topic that he really could pay attention. Um, he showed that he could follow instructions. He just, he really showed what a great student he is. Um, and there was this huge gap between um, the goals that were being offered and um, with science specifically, not even giving him access to be in a science class at all after he had already, you know, really shown us that he, he wants to do it and can do it. So um, to me, those kinds of times, and there have been other times too, where I see this big gap there, that's where I start to advocate. Can we, you know, make the goals a little bit more challenging? Can we provide more services or a different kind of environment? Because we know he can thrive when the setting is the right setting. And we know he can meet higher goals when, you know, he has the support to do it. So um, that that to me has been the most helpful is just thinking about those gaps. Yeah, and I, I think Sarah, that that's what you said is so, so important because you know, we, there is something called ableism, right? This, this a set of low expectations for people with disabilities or assumptions about what people can and can't do. And it can get in there and get in the way. It's kind of like other forms of isms, um, sexism, racism, et cetera. Um, and 
you know, appropriately ambitious goals um, are important. And I guess our biggest takeaway, especially for all of you who came tonight, is that the reason parents have all these rights, the reason you need to be at the table in these meetings, the reason you need to learn to use these processes is that nobody knows that child the way you do. Um, and the perspective that you can offer, um, you know, we had a, a child once who the district was proposing to remove all the child uh, related services, speech and OT, because they felt like she just wasn't benefiting from them. She had pretty significant intellectual and developmental disabilities and, and it was, you know, really hard. And I'll never forget her father sitting in our office telling me about this. And I said, well, you know, and I'm reading the district notes and to hear, to see what was in writing, you would think that this was a child who really didn't do very much of anything. Um, and then he said, well, they just don't know her. And I said, well, tell me about her. And he said, oh, well, let me show you a video. And he was a musician and she, he pulled out a video and showed me her drumming on his lap, just completely alive. Um, and that the district had never seen that little child. She didn't come to school because she wasn't being served in a way that she could access. So that's why your voice is so, so important. And the meaningful goals, we do a training at DREDA for free at least once a year on um, goal writing and so on, but you can also reach out to us to get examples of goals in different areas. It's also something the SELPA can help with, I, I've found. Um, and I think you can also, in an IEP meeting, just, you know, I, I find that the goal section is often really rushed. People will just say, okay, here's the goals that we drafted them, but we're really not expecting to change them much. And yet the whole IEP, we said it starts with present level based on evaluation, and then we set goals. And then we ask ourselves the question, what services, support, placement, et cetera, does that child need to meet those goals? So you see the problems, the goals are too low, the services, supports, et cetera, um, don't, don't follow. So it's a really important point. Reach out for help with that. Yes. Can I... Can I share one thing too that kind of trips parents up maybe? Um, Cause you said, how, how do I know um, if they're meaningful? Um, I think there's this perception that when you're looking at the testing data, um, either um, in a triennial assessment or sometimes schools do these quarterly or um, three times a year computer-based assessments and you see these grade level equivalents or what your student is ready to learn next. Um, to me, I like to describe that, well, that might be the floor, you know, and we can all agree that that's the floor, but I know my student has some scattered skills that are up that these tests can't quantify. So we need to use other information, observable and in student work to, to show that when given the supports that they need, um, my student can access these you know, grade level standards. So um, I guess not be wary of the quantifiable data that you might get in a triennial that says, this is what your student's grade, grade equivalent is or those computer-based assessments, that's just one piece of information. And those are really good at finding kind of the floor of your student's ability, but they aren't really great at determining what those scattered skills might look like. So it's important to, to see other um, pieces of information. Yeah, and I guess I just wanna add one point is this goes back to Melissa and the IEE example. One thing we see, and, and this isn't so much of an issue in, in our self, although it can come up, but just across the board, is that if you don't evaluate a child with someone who understands how to communicate with them non-verbally, or you don't communicate, or you don't evaluate them in their native language, um, or take the time to talk to their parents in their language, then you really miss so much critical information. So, um, you know, the IDEA says you know you can use a variety of measures, and that can include observations and teacher reports and input from parents and input from the student. We want students to be you know weighing in. I I remember my son at some point in high school just saying, "I'm not going to the resource room anymore. I hate it. I'm not going. It doesn't work for me. The kids make fun of me when I go, and you know I want if I need help, I want to be you know." Do it in this other way. So all of those things can can lead to that sort of culture of low expectations that that Anna's talking about. 
All right, we have about nine questions in the in the Q&A. So I'm gonna hold everyone to brief answers so we can try and hit on all of them. One of them is a follow-up to our question from a few minutes ago. So maybe we can finish that. This is based back to the question about if, if your child is no longer um, eligible, the IEP team feels your child, child is no longer eligible and that they're not demonstrating academic impairment. Um, if the parent believes without services, their academic performance would be impacted, what advice do you give in that scenario? So it sounds like they're discharging them from services, but they've had them up until now. And is that why they're successful or not? How do you, how would you address that? Well, this is where negotiation and skill comes into play in IEP meetings, because if it were me, I might say something like about for my own child, um, before we fade the services and exit the eligibility, why don't we come up with a plan to sort of slowly reduce them and see and gather data and see if we see a change in their academic performance. Let's not take a leap of faith and let them get really behind. This comes up a lot, I know, with learning disabilities, you know, just wait, wait for them to fail and then try to catch up again because each one of those impacts, you know, it takes more resources, it takes more time, it takes more money, and it hurts the child's academic self-confidence so much. So I think that's the, um, you know, my first reaction to that question is to make sure that you are um, you are using your parent rights, you're meaningfully engaging in the process and just saying, you know, my perspective is, by the way, when I sit down with my child to do homework, they have 10 minutes of attention. And I sit with them for the other 15 minutes so that they can complete their homework. And I'm doing X, Y, and Z. And here's a video of what it looks like when my child is you know, trying to do distance learning and, uh, you know, that kind of data and perspective can, can really uh, help with that problem too. I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to that. Okay, thanks. No, that's great, Cheryl. So this question addresses comp ed, uh, com compensatory education. So Anna, maybe I'll let you take a stab at this, although anyone can join in. Is some sort of proof required if you are require requesting comp ed that exceeds the actual minutes not fulfilled? So if it's not a one-to-one. -one. Um, you know, if it's a negotiation with the district, I've never been asked for proof, although sometimes an IE or an ind or your own private assessor comes in and that could be part of the list of recommendations. Um, so I've seen I, I've seen that be a really useful um, documentation to um, make your formula valid. Right, so it's not just one to one, but you know, there's this independent assessor that's also saying they need twice as much now in order to catch up. Um, sometimes districts will, it, let's say that you've already intervened and you're paying for tutoring because they don't have a math teacher or speech or OT or whatever, then you might be required to provide um, a paid invoice to reimburse. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. And this is a question for Cheryl. Can someone whose English is limited seek help from DREDF? Is there someone they can talk to in, in any other language? And what are the other languages available? We have both Spanish um, and Mandarin right now, but we have other PTIs who have other language availability. So we will work with you to get an interpreter. And there have been a couple of messages asking about the presentation. So the slides are in the chat, but I think um, I can I will speak for our, our group that we can certainly send an email to be distributed to the member districts with a link to the slides and a link to the presentation once that's available. So we can we can certainly do that. It looks like there's interest in that. Um, another question, how does how long does a school district have to respond to your request for prior written notice when an IEP team refuses to change an IEP? Okay, hold on. Give Let me that see. one to Cheryl or Anna, not me. <laughs> well, so there's no, there's no strict, there's no strict rule. Um, I'm so glad that somebody knows what prior written notice is. And for those of you who don't, when the district is refusing or offering, you know, you know to, to make a change of placement, to, to not do, like you're asking for a one-on-one -on -one aid and they're saying we're not going to provide a one-on-one -on -one aid. Um, it's really important to not just leave the meeting feeling like, well, they just didn't even consider it or said, we don't do that or whatever. So you need to know this term, um, which is when can I expect prior written notice? 
which will outline the legal reasons and the data and, and evidence that the district is using to make that decision. You can't know how to argue back or even negotiate back if you don't know what information they're basing the decision on. And my sense is that sometimes it's just, we don't have that feature, we don't have that program, we've never done that before. And those aren't really valid reasons. So the prior written notice is just, it's a fancy way of saying the district has to tell you in writing. There's no strict timeline, but I like to set timelines. Like when can I expect prior written notice? How about within five business days? Get it, you know, can you put it in the notes so the district is gonna respond to me? Um, it's not real binding on the district, but it shouldn't be an unreasonable delay. All right, then we have a couple more ADR questions um, and a comment. So one, one person commented that they also found there was more power at the district level in their experience and they did an ADR, but didn't actually know it was an ADR. Um, someone else asked the question, can you use info you learn in the ADR in a complaint or filing for a hearing, given that you signed a non-disclosure? I think that one's for Anna. Yeah. Yeah. So the letter in which you request the ADR, where you list what you notice and your concerns, all of that is very helpful when filing a complaint or due process hearing. So you've already established the um, paper trail even before you get to the ADR meeting. And then let's say you don't have resolution, just continue with your documentation um, after that meeting. Um, you can continue to say, you know, these concerns I brought up in this letter dated on blah, blah, blah are still unresolved. So um, you can continue with the paper trail process um, without disclosing what you discussed in the actual meeting. Yeah, and I want to add to that. Um, the one of the downsides of using ADR or even mediation sometimes where there will be settlements is that, and just something we all need to work on systemically, is that these are often confidential agreements, which means that no other parent can know that you got the settlement. You know, nobody else can know what the resolution was. And that's, you know, for, I find that sometimes very difficult. You know, it, it creates a sort of unlevel playing field where some people can negotiate and get X, Y, and Z and other people aren't successful and, um, there's, you know, just some inequity can, can creep into that as well. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, just something to, to think about before you sign it, because, you know, you need to do what's right for your child and your family, but you also, you know, sometimes it's the, the value of a compliance complaint, we didn't talk about this, is that it can be what's called a various complaint, meaning you're filing it on behalf of your child and all similarly situated children. And the California Department of Ed will come in and they will pull files and look at other children who are similarly situated and look for patterns and trends. And some of the corrective actions that they may issue may be get, you know, do a professional development on this issue, do more on behavior, look at least restrictive environment more or whatever. So that, that, that's a big plus in terms of those California uh, Department of Ed compliance complaints. All right, and then Carlos and Letty had your hand up. You were next to be called on. You put your hand down. If you would like to talk, I'm happy to uh, give you the floor or maybe your question was answered. Um, so if you, if you still have a question, please put your hand up. Um, and then we have a couple of IEE questions. So uh, one question is, can you speak to what happens if the district has hoops to jump through that make it impossible to find an evaluator or if their fee structures are too low to hire the evaluator you want? I'm happy to speak to that, but Anna, I don't know if you, other people wanna to speak to that. Um, so first of all, when you ask for an independent educational evaluation, this is all in the resource, so I don't wanna take a lot of time. There's the district must respond without unreasonable delay and they must say yes or no. And we call that fund or file, meaning yes, we'll fund it. Here's some evaluators you can use, but you aren't limited to our list. Here's our cost limitations. Here's what kind of qualifications the person needs. Oh, they have to be fingerprinted. They have to carry X, Y, Z amount of insurance. We find that a lot of barriers come into that, into play in that, in that process. Call us. Um, about that. There's a, there's a very important way to get an exception and there's a very a particular resource called Letter to Parker where guidance was issued about how parents can say, I need you to pay more because we have an exceptional situation or I called every evaluator on your list and no one does it for $500. 
Um, so there, there are ways to get around that. Give us a call. Great, thank you. And then is the school obligated to accept the findings from an IEE? This person shared they have a high schooler with some elements of dyslexia and ADD. The school has never listed dyslexia in her IEP in elementary, middle, or high school. Okay, um, I'll quickly take a stab at it. Um, uh, no, they must consider it. That's the language of the law. Um, it's not binding on them, but when, that's why what Sarah, I know, what Melissa said about finding a really good assessor that you feel good and is competent um, is why it's so important because they then can be a witness in a hearing about what they found when they did their independent assessment. So if the district refuses to agree with it and they have that right, they can say we considered it, but we're not in agreement with it. Um, then your next step is that you can file for a hearing, but now you have someone who did an independent assessment and the more qualified they are and the better and more thorough a job they did, the more empowered you are to push back. All right, I'm gonna take our, la in our last minute, our last question. What do you do if you don't agree with the tools that the district uses for their assessment? Oh, uh, that's, that's such an important question. Um, First of all, we parents are not going to be, most of us have no idea what the difference between the Woodcock Johnson 4 and 3 are, or whether we should use the WISC, or which subtests were used and which ones weren't, weren't even given, right? You might not know that that test has nine subtests, but they only gave three and missed out on some of that. So those are things that are really hard. In fact, we're at Dredis this summer, we're going to do an, a presentation for free on how to read and understand evaluations because it is really important. I think you know that's where the IEE comes in because another assessor can say, well, actually, I'm really surprised they didn't use this instrument or that's not the standard in the field or, or whatever. But the district does get to choose what instruments they wanna use, but they're supposed to follow a process where they do the evaluation and based on what they find, they go down that road. So, right, you do an evaluation, you see problems with phonological processing and hearing sounds and so on. And then you think, okay, I, maybe I should do some more investigating. There's these other subtests I should use. And that's one of the places where we see corners sometimes being taken. And that's where the power of the IEE really comes into play. Well, I just want to thank all of the panelists, Anna, Cheryl, Melissa, and Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences, your stories, and your expertise. It's been hugely helpful. Um, thank you to Director Babcock, who was very supportive in meeting with the Education Committee, helping us to set up and run this, this session tonight. And thank you to the Education Committee members who um, have worked so hard to put this together. Um, finally, thank you to the directors who attended tonight, and thank you to all of the, um, the other participants who came. Um, as I said, we will send emails to the districts with a link to the slides and a link to the recording and I suspect it will end up some a link on the CAC website, but we can certainly send emails out to people to make it easy to find. And um, we hope to see see you at um, future um, CAC meetings. It's the fourth Monday of every month. Um, and um, and again, in the education committee has anyone is welcome. So let us know if you'd like to help us plan the education topics for for next school year. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Good night.